giving me the opportunity to talk to you guys about uh, cardiovascular disease. So, um, without further ado, I know this is actually late today and uh, we're going to get started. So, coronary artery disease actually is a part of cardiovascular disease, which is uh, actually a term that we use to define diseases of the heart and blood vessels. So, cardio stands for heart and and uh, vascular is actually blood vessels. So these are going to be the diseases of the um, heart and blood vessels. I'm sure you guys would have heard of the examples. Um, the most common one is the heart attack, which is coronary artery disease, and cerebrovascular disease, which is actually manifests itself as stroke or mini strokes, and then congestive heart failure, you guys are going to be familiar with that as well, and peripheral vascular disease or peripheral arterial disease, which is actually when the same uh, pathology involves the limbs, or arms and legs. So why are we talking about this? This is actually a big health problem. Heart attack is actually the number one cause of death in both men and women. Almost about 800,000 people die of heart attack every year only in the United States. So imagine throughout the world. And nearly 2,600 people in the United States die every day of cardiovascular disease. So it's actually a huge health problem. Almost one death every 33 seconds. And actually it used to be a disease of old age, but actually now we're seeing that a lot of younger folks are also having this problem and almost 150,000 people who die of cardiovascular disease, they are younger than 65 years of age. How big is the problem globally? This is actually the number one cause of death throughout the world as well. Almost about 12 million fatalities annually. And during the last 30 years, there have been actually a lot of progress in developed countries because of the health awareness and all the government programs. However, there has been an alarming increase in developed countries, especially in China and, and, and India. And probably that's because we're exporting all those McDonald's and Burger Kings to them, actually, which is a big risk factor for developing cardiovascular disease. So this is actually a big health issue. And to understand that how can we prevent this, because this is one of the most preventable problem as well, although it's actually most prevalent, but this is very preventable as well. To understand that, we actually need to understand the pathophysiology. So the heart is actually the most hard-working muscle in our body. It pumps about four to six liters of blood each minute, about 2,000 gallons of blood each day. And it supplies nutrients to the rest of the body, nutrients and oxygen. And since this is the most hard-working muscle of the body, it in of itself needs oxygen as well, as well as nutrients. So coronaries are actually blood vessels which are on top of the heart itself. So this is actually a cartoon of the heart. That is the right coronary artery and this is the left anterior descending artery. There are three arteries that supply blood to the heart. And these are called coronaries. So what happens is that actually with um, coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease manifests as atherosclerosis, which in general terms we call as hardening of the arteries. The atherosclerosis, actually, how it develops is over time, fatty material, which is called as plaque, that deposits inside these arteries. The artery, if you look at it in a cross section, there are three different layers of an artery, and over time, this fatty deposit will start depositing in between the layer of the arteries, and then with further accumulation, it will encroach on the lumen of the artery and it will cause it to narrow down. And so the artery, the area which was supplied by this artery is going to have compromised blood flow. So if that area is brain, it can actually cause stroke. If that area is a leg or arm, that will actually manifest as peripheral arterial disease. And if that area is heart, that will actually manifest itself as coronary artery disease, which can actually then be manifested as angina or heart attack or sudden cardiac death. So when the heart actually, when atherosclerosis develops in coronary arteries, 
and there is decreased blood flow to the heart muscle. The heart muscle actually uh, starts start dysfunction and actually what happens is that when there is decreased blood flow, there is decreased oxygen supply to the, to the heart cells and the heart cells start to die and actually that's what heart attack is. So what we need to do is actually how can we open up those arteries as quickly as possible. So what we need to do is actually we need to realize when somebody is having a heart attack so that we can call 911 right away and actually get them to the hospital as soon as possible. So if someone knows the signs and symptoms of heart attack, their um, chances of survival are much higher. And so this is actually a very important slide, which actually shows the signs and symptoms of heart attack. The predominant symptom of a heart attack is going to be chest pain. However, majority of the time it's going to be an uncomfortable pressure or fullness in the chest, rather than just chest pain. Or it could be just a squeezing sensation, or pain spreading to both the shoulders, or neck, or jaw, or it could be actually pain in between the shoulder blades, not just pain in the center of the chest or it could be just lightheadedness or fainting, or it could be shortness of breath with or without chest discomfort. So all of these are actually red flags. When that happens, that means that actually the person could be having heart attack, and if you see that someone or you are having these symptoms, you should call 911 right away and actually get them to, to the medical facility. Why is that important? Because if we initiate the treatment earlier, we will prevent death as well as further consequences which is the congestive heart failure. For example, this one study showed that if a block artery is opened within one hour of the onset of symptoms, there is 50% reduction in mortality. So if somebody has a blocked artery and we open it up within first hour, that actually is great because it will decrease the incidence of heart failure as well. Congestive heart failure actually is the inability of the heart muscle to, to supply the blood flow to the, to the rest of the body which is needed. So if the heart muscle is damaged, then heart failure will ensue and actually um, if we get the patient sooner to the hospital, we'll be able to open up the artery sooner and actually we'll be able to prevent heart failure as well. So how can actually we prevent atherosclerosis or coronary artery disease? We need to understand the risk factors. The risk factors are modifiable risk factors and unmodifiable risk factors. The unmodifiable risk factors are risk factors that actually we, we don't have any control over, which are gender, meaning that actually males are more likely to have atherosclerosis and cardiovascular diseases as, as compared to women. Family history, obviously we cannot change our family history. And race, so um, like African Americans, they are actually more uh, likely to have high blood pressure. Mexicans, they are actually um, more likely to have diabetes, so, so that's how actually um, race plays a role in cardiovascular disease. Age, the older we get, the more likely we are going to have cardiovascular disease. The modifiable risk factors, they are actually very important because these are the ones that we can change and they are high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, physical inactivity, obesity, stress and anger. So let's actually talk about modifiable risk factors. So high blood pressure, the high blood pressure actually is also very prevalent. It's one of the most common reasons that people will develop cardiovascular disease. One in three adults in the United States actually have high blood pressure, which increases the risk for heart disease as well as stroke. These are the first and third leading causes of death in the United States. High, high blood pressure is also called as um, silent killer because High blood pressure in of itself does not have any warning signs and, signs and symptoms and actually when the signs and symptoms develop, it's usually too late. So that's why actually it's very important to know what your blood pressure is and actually since it doesn't have any signs or symptoms, it's very important to have it checked. The optimum level of blood pressure is less than 120 or 80 millimeter Hg. 
how do we prevent high blood pressure? Um, so when we talk about these modifiable risk factors, there are going to be three things, which are diet, exercise, and weight loss. These are three things which are actually lifestyle modifications that we're going to be talking about. So how can we prevent high blood pressure? By eating right. And what are, what are those eating habits? By eating fresh fruits and vegetables, eating foods that are low in saturated fat and cholesterol, and sodium restriction to 2,000 milligrams per day. So how do we actually limit sodium? By limiting the amount of salt that we put in our food, and also, we need to be aware that all the processed foods, they are high in sodium, so we need to start reading labels as well, that actually the amount of food that we are consuming or whatever we are eating, it might not taste salty, but it might have a lot of sol sodium as a preservative. The other thing that we need to do to maintain uh, normal blood pressure is to have a healthy weight. Being overweight can raise blood pressure, and losing weight can help reduce blood pressure. And losing, we are not talking about ideal body weight, just losing even 10 pounds of weight can reduce blood pressure about, about 5 to 10 points. When we talk about weight, um, we actually, everybody has to have a different weight for, the weight is actually according to their, to their height. So the term that we use is called body mass index or BMI. The body mass index is the ratio of body weight in kilo kilograms and height in meters. So ideal body weight for somebody is a BMI of less than 25. And people who have BMI or body mass index between 25 and 30, they're classified as overweight. And people whose BMIs are more than 30, they're classified as obese. And, um, Another um, lifestyle modification that we need to do to prevent high blood pressure is being physically active. So physical activity can help lower the blood pressure and adults should have at least moderate physical activity for majority of the days of the week. So at least four days of the week they should have uh, some moderate physical activity. And what is moderate physical activity? Walking for at least two miles in 30 minutes, so at least 15 minutes per mile, that should be the pace, or just racking leaves for 30 minutes. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to join a gym, you don't have to actually take classes, however, if you can do that, that's very good. Um, shoveling snow for 15 minutes, jumping rope for 15 minutes, just shooting basket for 30 minutes, these are all moderate physical activity that actually you can do to get the benefit of this activity and actually you will see at least four to nine points of blood pressure lowering um, in, in, the, uh, in, pe in people who have high blood pressure. Smoking is another big risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Um, and uh, this is actually a study published in New England Journal of Medicine which shows the relationship of smoking to cardiovascular disease. It actually shows that people who never smoked if their relative risk of developing heart attack was one, then people who actually smoke about one to 14 cigarettes, their risk of having a heart attack is three times higher. People who actually smoke 15 cigarettes or more, their risk of having a heart attack is five times or higher. So there's actually a linear relationship with the amount of cigarettes that one smokes and the risk that they can have a heart attack. Cholesterol, Hypercholesterolemia or high cholesterol is actually another uh, big risk factor for developing cardiovascular disease. It's also very prevalent as well. One in six adults in the United States has high cholesterol. Cholesterol is actually a part and parcel of our body. All our cells, all the cell membrane is made up of cholesterol. All the brain is nothing but cholesterol. All the nerves, they are actually covered with, uh, with cholesterol as well. However, if the cholesterol is too much in our body, it's going to start accumulate in the blood vessels and that will lead to atherosclerosis and that will actually cause cardiovascular disease. So, once again, cholesterol like blood pressure does not have symptoms. So unless and until we check our, our numbers, unless and until we, we do a blood test, we would not know whether we have high cholesterol or not. When we do a blood test that is called as lipid profile, 
there are the, the different type of cholesterols that we check. One is actually total cholesterol, and a normal level for total cholesterol is less than 200. The triglycerides is another type of bad cholesterol that we want the numbers to be less than 150. And then there are two other types of cholesterol, the LDL and the HDL. The LDL is actually low-density lipoprotein, and that's the bad cholesterol. That is a cholesterol that is actually very much implicated in the development of cardiovascular disease. And we usually target the LDL cholesterol. And the target is different for different people. So people who are diabetics, we want their LDL cholesterol to, less, to be less than 100. People who, are, uh, who have had a heart attack or who have had a bypass surgery or a stent put in, we want their cholesterol to be less than 70. For people who have one or two risk factors, like being diabetic or high blood pressure, but do not have, or people who have high blood pressure in family history, but are not diabetic and do not have cardiovascular disease, we want their cholesterol to be less than 130. The HDL, which is the high density lipoprotein, that's actually the good cholesterol. What that does is actually it takes the cholesterol from the periphery and brings it back to the liver, and then the liver flushes it out from the body. So that's how actually it helps us to uh, prevent us from having cardiovascular disease. So how do we lower our cholesterol? Once again, the same lifestyle modifications, the three things, which are eating right, exercise, and weight loss. So these are the three things that if we do, we will actually be able to have the cholesterol levels that are recommended. If somebody's cholesterol levels are high, we prescribe medications to them as well, and then they have to adhere to that. Diabetes is another big risk factor for developing cardiovascular disease. Um, at any given cholesterol level, if somebody's cholesterol is even perfectly normal, a diabetic is going to be two to three times at higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease as compared to the general, to, to the general population. And diabetics have actually such prevalent cardiovascular disease that 80% of diabetics, they die of cardiovascular disease and risk of sudden cardiac death is very high in diabetics because of actually them developing um, uh, coronary artery disease and heart attack. Controlling blood sugar is very important. Once again, initially, if the blood sugars are not extremely high, person is going to be asymptomatic. So unless and until we check our blood sugars, we would not know whether the blood sugars are high or not. A normal blood sugar level, fasting is less than 100. If somebody's blood sugar is between 100 to 125, we call it as pre-diabetic range. If somebody's blood sugar and fasting is 126 or more, we label them as diabetic. If blood sugar after meals, after two hours after meals, it should be less than 140. And how do we control blood sugar? Once again, the lifestyle modification, which is the three things. Eating right, exercise, and weight loss. And if somebody is diabetic, they have to adhere to their prescribed medications, what their um, physicians have told them. So if somebody adheres to these lifestyle modifications and they have not developed cardiovascular disease, it's well and good. However, a lot of people do develop cardiovascular disease and then they need something more, meaning some kind of intervention. So if they have angina or heart attack, then they will need an angioplasty or even worse, they will actually need a bypass surgery. So what is angioplasty? So this cartoon actually shows a diagram of heart, and this is the artery that's on top of the heart muscle, and this instep is actually a magnified view of that. So if this segment has atherosclerosis, has, has hardening of the arteries, this actually has narrowed the lumen, and this is the cause of angina or heart attack, what we do is actually we put a catheter either in the groin or from the wrist artery and go to the heart and then inject the dye and under x-ray picture we can identify where the blockage is and then we can put a small wire through and we can put a balloon catheter right up to that blockage and then we inflate that balloon that compresses the plaque against the artery wall that opens up the artery and actually open up the lumen and then we can put in a stent 
which is actually a metallic spring that keeps the RE open. The RE actually is elastic, so when we do the balloon angioplasty, we compress the plaque, but when we deflate the balloon and actually take it out, some of the lumen that we had already gained, that actually compresses back. So the stent actually keeps it open. And sometimes the plaque can actually have calcium in it as well, and it's very, very hard to actually break that calcium with, uh, with, uh, with a balloon. So then we have a device that we call as rotoblader. The plumbers actually call it rotorooters. So they, we actually take the rotoblader and actually it has diamond specs at the end and it revolves at a, at a speed of 150,000 to 200,000 revolutions per minute. It actually spins very fast and actually it can um, take away the calcium from the plaque and actually smoothens the artery out and then we can put in a stent. So that's how actually angioplasty can be done. And if the, the atherosclerosis has, the, has involved a lot of arteries, like three or more, or if the left main coronary artery is involved, then stenting is not going to be an option, and then actually they will need bypass surgery. And what bypass surgery is, that actually the surgeon can take an artery from the leg, or from the arm, or from the chest wall, and they can actually, the, the, the blood vessel from the leg, they will attach it to the aorta, and then they will attach it to the artery downstream to the blockage. So suppose this is the right coronary artery, there's a blockage right here. The surgeon would actually take the vein graft, will attach it to the aorta, take the conduit and actually attach it downstream and will restore the blood flow. Since they are bypassing the blockage, that's why it is called as a bypass surgery. So, however, we don't want people to have bypass surgery or stenting done. And so how do we do that? By prevention. And how do we do prevention? As by all the stuff that we talked about, first of all, get a regular medical checkup, check your blood pressure and actually try to control it. The normal, the optimal level was less than 120, the top number, less than 80, the bottom number. Check your cholesterol level and try to actually maintain the normal cholesterol levels. And check your, and don't smoke. People who are smoking, they, should, they need to quit smoking. Um, if somebody needs help, there are actually medications, there are programs that are available that people can enroll in and help quit smoking. We need to start exercise regularly and moderate physical activity at least four days of the week. That is the least amount. Maintain a healthy weight. What was the healthy weight? was the body mass index of 25 or less. Eat a heart healthy diet which was more fruits, more vegetables and foods with low, low fat and low, less cholesterol and limit the amount of salt that we are going to be adding to our food. That's actually heart healthy diet. And then manage stress. So that's actually easier said than done. So that's actually about the cardiovascular disease. I'll be happy to take any questions if you guys have. If you don't, then we will move on to our AEB talk. Please. <clears throat> when they do the bypass, yeah. what's happening with the artery which is plugged? Okay, so um, the artery which is plugged stays in place. So suppose this artery was plugged right here. The surgeon is not going to take away this artery because upstream this artery is still supplying these small branches. You see this was actually the main artery which is coming down and it was going down and it was going to supply the bottom portion of the heart. However, before the blockage, it was still giving off those other branches. So what's happening is with this blockage, the blood flow was not going downstream. So now after bypass, it's going to go downstream and actually the artery which was supplying above it, it's going to still supply those branches. The next question, as an ordinary person, when do you think, uh, what kind of symptoms I should have to consider that I might have a heart problem? Not a heart attack, I mean like... Uh, mm -hmm. To have heart issues, exactly. So, very good question, thank you very much, uh, Brother Wassam. So, um, the symptoms can be easy fatigability. Chest pain is going to be the biggest one that everybody would know, that if they do any kind of exertion, and it doesn't have to be chest pain, it will be a chest pressure or a fullness that you do 
um, exertion that you were able to do before, suppose you were able to walk up two flights of stairs with ease, and now after two flights of stairs, you're actually having this chest pressure. The other thing is actually shortness of breath. If you are getting out of breath with minimal exertion or with the same exertion that you were able to do before, that's actually another uh, reason to actually consider. Some people can have lightheadedness, dizziness, or either fluttering sensation that we call as palpitations. That's also, that also indicates that there is something going on which is irritating your heart. That's why there is electrical instability that you're feeling your heart racing or flip-flopping. So these will be some of the uh, common symptoms that people can have. Please. What factors causes heart issues for people who have uh, high blood sugar? Like so why diabetics are more prone to developing cardiovascular disease was the question. Very good question. Actually, cardio diabetes, what it does is that this hyperglycemia, when the blood sugar is too high, it just deranges the, the, the function of the cells. And it makes the, the artery wall, as we were talking about, that is actually made up of three different layers, intima, media, and adventitia. The intima is actually the endothelium, which is a functional organ in of itself. So when there is hyperglycemia, when the blood sugar levels are higher than normal, the function of that organ is not optimal. And so the cholesterol levels can seep in and go inside those, the, the intimal cells and can accumulate. The other thing is actually the defense mechanism of the body is also not, not, uh, not up to par. So infections can happen and actually all those inflammatory markers will lead to diffuse atherosclerosis. Um, so diabetes actually will not only lead to cardiovascular disease, uh, nerves, neuropathy is actually another one. All the systems are affected, kidneys are affected, eyes are affected, so the whole organ system is not going to be functioning as adequately as it will at normal blood sugar levels. Um, okay. uh, if someone has a family history, like a family risk, is there any exam one should take uh, to examine himself or his family, and also at what age should he do this exam? Thank you very much. Very good question. Thank you. So, family history for coronary artery disease is going to be different than family history for sudden cardiac death. These are two different things. So when we talk about, like, suppose somebody comes in with symptoms, like Brother Bassam was asking, I'm not having heart attack, but I am having some symptoms that I am concerned that, as if I am having heart problems. Suppose I go to my doctor and say that I'm having chest pain or shortness of breath or easy fatigability, one of the major things that he's going to be asking me about my family history, did anybody in my family had a heart attack or stroke? So the family history is going to be important if a male member in my family had a heart attack or stroke before age 55. And if a fat female member of my family had a heart attack or stroke before age 65. Otherwise, if it's actually after 55 in males and after 65 in females, it's just an aging process. So for coronary artery disease, that is important that actually people who have premature coronary artery disease history in the family, they need to be more alert, they need to be actually even more up to par on their medical checkups, they need to have their blood cholesterol levels checked at least once a year, they need to check their blood sugar levels, they need to check their uh, blood pressure at least twice a year. So these are the things that actually one needs to know. And then you also need to know what your weight is, what your body mass index is. We need to actually try to achieve all of those, those, those uh, numbers that are modifiable risk factors that we talked about so that that person as an individual does not have cardiovascular disease or early coronary artery disease. The other thing is actually sudden cardiac death, which is also a very important thing. If somebody has a first degree relative who has died suddenly prior to age 35, then they can have some cardiac problems like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, like you would actually hear in athletes who die actually on the field. That's a different kind of problem that you need to go and have yourself checked out either by your family doctor or by your cardiologist. And we can do exams like an echocardiogram or an EKG, which can actually tell us about those problems, or there could be 
other electrical problems on your EKG, like long QT syndrome um, or arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. These are some of the things which can actually lead to sudden cardiac death in an early age. So if somebody has a first degree relative who has died without any evident cause prior to age 35, then they need to be checked out by their physicians as well. I'm oh, sorry? Oh, thank you very much. So, um, Brother Anis is asking that actually how the, the water uh, is accumulated around the heart. So that's actually a very common symptom that we describe to people who have congestive heart failure. And heart failure is a term that we use routinely as well. Um, so heart failure is defined as actually the failure of the heart to meet the demands of the body. The heart, in essence, actually is two different pumps. There's a right-sided pump and a left-sided pump. It looks like in the body, when you look at the human being, that probably the heart is situated between the lungs. But in reality, the lungs are actually sandwiched between the two sides of the heart, functionally. What happens is that actually the left side of the heart pumps the blood to the rest of the body. The blood would circulate in the body and actually comes back to the right side of the heart. The right side then pumps it to the lungs and then the lungs, from the lungs actually we exhale carbon dioxide, inhale oxygen and that oxygenated blood then goes to the left side of the heart. So if somebody has had a heart attack or if they have a weak heart, the left side would not be able to pump all the blood which is coming from the lungs. So the blood would backlog on the lungs. And that's how actually they will get fluid build up on their lungs. And that's why they become short of breath. So, and you would have seen that people who have congestive heart failure, they are more short of breath when they lie down. When they lie down, the fluid actually goes and it spreads over the lungs, so they are actually more short of breath. So they want to sit up so that actually with gravity, the fluid settles down in the lungs and actually the upper uh, lungs are actually free and we can still have exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So heart failure is actually what would lead to fluid accumulation of the lungs. And then if the right side of the heart fails, then we will start seeing swelling in our ankles. So that's how actually the swelling in the ankles, that's actually another sign that, or, or symptom that people can come up with that I'm seeing actually that my ankles are swelling now. So that's also a sign of heart failure that you should consult with your physician. Jazakumullah Khairi, you touched both of my question, uh, and I reiterate this a little bit. The first one was the, uh, the 16, 17 year old that we're having uh, sudden cardiac arrest. Okay. And, uh, so I'm thinking that was there any study that have shown or at least kind of identify the causes because some of them really, uh, I have a friend at work with his son last year. Uh, again, good, strong, healthy football player all of a sudden collapsed. Mm -hmm. The AED was present so that it would revive him but again still have not identified the cause. So that's one question. The other one you already addressed, the family history, so I'm thinking for the race as well. The unmodifiable factors that you talked mm -hmm. about probably applicable the same with the race, or would that be different with the family history? So, um, family history is actually, so there's no specific um, sudden cardiac death um, etiologies that we can actually say that this specific race is more at risk. However, some races are more prone to developing high blood pressure, like African Americans that we talked about. Uh, Mexicans, they are actually Hispanics, they are more prone to developing diabetes. Uh, we, from Southeast Asia, we have lesser amounts of high density lipoprotein, which is actually the good cholesterol, which is the protective uh, cholesterol. Uh, however, the sudden cardiac death is usually a genetic marker. So either the parents or one of the first degree relatives will have that gene. So that's why it is very much related to that family. So that's why family history is going to be very much important. And if certain cardiac death happens, and this is very unfortunate, it's kind of something that's very devastating for the whole community when it happens. Because usually it's athletes, they're very avid athletes and they do very well, but all of a sudden it's actually just a very devastating, catastrophic, uh, stuff for, for everybody. 
if sudden cardiac death happens in the family, then all the first degree relatives, all the brothers and sisters, they need to be screened for, for things that we at this point in time know. So some of the things that I said was the long QT syndrome, which can be diagnosed on an ECG. There is something called a Brugada syndrome, which once again can be diagnosed on EKG. There is a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that ECG can either diagnose or echocardiogram can diagnose. Um, there is something called ARVD, which is arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, which MRI can diagnose. So, so once again, these are different things that we look for. Um, and there are probably still some other uh, etiologies that we still don't know about. So there could be some cases that still can be undiagnosed. So family history is actually very important in, in those cases. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, um, I have a question because uh, uh, is there any study uh, that the Muslim, the we Muslim who pray regularly, they have a lower chance because for five ta da daily prayer, it's about 15 minutes you can say. That's exercise. Is there any study for that? I am personally am not aware of any study. However, spirituality leads to help a person. I mean, it doesn't have to be Muslim, but spirituality is, is something that can be in any religion. Spirituality does lead to stress reduction. And actually, people who are more spiritual, they are able to cope with stress much better. And as we know as well, Allah bi zikr Allahi So people who are zakirin, they actually have this, this peace in their heart. And that actually helped them to reduce the stress, and actually stress is a major factor in developing cardiovascular disease. However, I am not aware of any, any studies that are out there, though. Please. I'm sorry? Um, thank you very much. So, so hypothyroidism, Thyroid is actually a very important gland in our body which uh, regulates the metabolism of our body and the basal metabolic rate. So when thyroid is functioning too much, that is called hyperthyroidism, and when it's not working too much, that is called hypothyroidism. Dr. Sajda is asking about hypothyroidism, meaning that actually the thyroid is not working very well, whether that will have any effects on the heart or not. The heart actually, is very sensitive to to the adrenaline responses as well as all the hormonal changes in in our body so thyroid plays a very important role so people who have hyperthyroidism or thyrotoxicosis they usually present with their heart racing in their chest with arrhythmias uh, with high blood pressure and people who have hypothyroidism, they will have slow heart rate. And the slow heart rate actually will, they can also have what we call as mixed edema. They will have uh, swelling in their ankles, but they also go into heart failure and their heart actually dilates as well. Uh, so mixed edema can lead to dilated cardiomyopathy as well as bradycardia, as well as heart failure. And the, similarly, Thyrotoxicosis could lead to what we call as high output failure, meaning that actually the heart is beating really fast, but the metabolism of the body is so much that the heart cannot keep up with and actually just burns out. So thyroid actually does play a very important role in, in the heart health. Sure. Waalaikumsalam. to implant a pacemaker in the heart, like uh, what was installed in deep Chinese heart. And then the other question is, uh, the stent that is implanted in the artery, will it be removed? And if it's not removed, does it corrode? Thank you. Very, very um, good questions. Thank you very much. So the first question was about pacemakers. Uh, and actually, I heard about Dick Cheney that what kind of pacemaker he had, is that the question? Thank you. So, yes, there, there's something called a pacemaker and then there's something called a defibrillator. We're going to talk about a defibrillator today, but this is AED, which is the automatic 
external defibrillator, and then we have something that we call as ICD, which is implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So there's a pacemaker device which does not jump start the heart, but it only provides the electrical impulse for the heart because the electrical system of the heart can sometimes, the wiring can either short circuit or there can be a misconnection between the wiring. So then the top chambers and the bottom chambers, they do not communicate and people can actually have passing out spells. So if they are having too slow of a heart, heart rate, normal heart rate is between 60 to 100. Some people actually, they're not able to increase their heart rate, we call it chronotropic incompetence, and then if they exert themselves, they just um, get exhausted really, really easily. And if that's the case, then actually a pacemaker can be uh, an, uh, a, a treatment for them. The other thing is actually if their heart rate is too slow, or if they have an electrical conduction block, the pacemaker will be uh, an answer for that. However, defibrillator, the ICD, which is the implantable cardioverter defibrillator, is almost twice the size of a pacemaker. A pacemaker is almost about uh, the size of this uh, pager. And that goes under the skin. It doesn't go under the ribs. And there are wires that actually you put in one of the veins under the collarbone and then go to the heart. And they, the, that ICD looks at the heart rhythm 24 7. And if that person goes into that electrical abnormality, which could be fatal, it actually recognizes that and actually shocks the person and actually saves his life. However, there are people who are at risk of sudden cardiac death. So all of us are at sudden cardiac death risk. However, certain cardiac condition, as we were talking about the family history, so if somebody has a family history of sudden cardiac death and they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or Brugada syndrome, then they are at risk of sudden cardiac death. So they will be qualifying for having that ICD, which will be actually a life-saving device for them. And if somebody has a very weak heart, uh, there's a term that we refer to as ejection fraction, which is the pumping ability of the heart muscle known as about 55 and 75. People whose ejection fraction is 35% or less than that, they are at a 30% higher risk of developing sudden cardiac death than normal population. And these are the people who would actually qualify for a defibrillator to be implanted. And that's the person that actually we would implant a device in. So that's actually one, I hope that, that answered your, your question. The second one was actually about the stents, that uh, if we implant the stent, can we take it out? And then do they corrode? So very good questions. These are actually questions that people usually ask and actually uh, the patients who have the stents. So thank you for bringing this up. What happens is actually the body is just amazing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us in such a fabulous way that it has its own process of healing. So when we put a stent in somebody, we, we usually put them on blood thinners. I don't know whether anybody here has stents or not, but they need to be on blood thinners because if they are not on blood thinners, when the blood comes and touches that stainless steel or the cobalt chromium, it thinks that there's a breach in the arterial wall and it has to form a blood clot. So if they are not on blood thinners, they will clot off that artery. So we put them on, on blood thinners like Plavix or Effiant and Aspirin. So what happens is that after four to six weeks, if this is a bare metal stent, meaning that this is just a cobalt chromium or a stainless steel stent, that intima, that endothelium that we were talking about, it just grows over that stent. It covers it completely, like another skin grows over the stent, and then it becomes a part of that, that artery. So then the blood cells, which are the platelets, if they come and, and touch that, that area, it's not coming in contact with the metal, so then you can actually stop taking the plavix at that point in time. The blood thinners, and actually you will not have thrombosis. So it gets incorporated into the body. It doesn't, it has, it doesn't come out. And then it doesn't corrode either. However, as you can see here, is that actually what we are doing is that the segment which actually had the plaque, we are not doing anything with that plaque. We're just pushing it away from, from the lumen and we're just putting in that stent, right? So that artery, that segment is already diseased. What I tell my patients is that actually, 
if we were able to block God-given arteries, man-made stents is no match. So don't think that actually you have a stent and you're cured. The disease segment is still there. It means actually you still have to take care of yourself. You have to control your blood pressure, you have to control your diabetes, your cholesterol level, cigarette smoking needs to go away. If you don't, then actually that stent will close back up. And that's the area that actually will develop problems. So the stent doesn't come out, however, it can still have problems down the road. What's happening with the blood when you put the stent mm -hmm. and the other blood, or the blood is shaking the blood? Yeah. What's happening with the teeth with the blood itself before the blood? <coughs> So, thank you, Wasiya. So, so, there are two different things that actually can happen. One is that actually the plaque was developing and slowly and gradually it was encroaching on the artery lumen to the point that actually when it occupies 70% of the area of the artery, that's where it leads to blood flow limitation and that's when a patient will start having symptoms. So if a person has 40% or 50% plaque, if I do a stress test on them, I cannot detect that. And they will not have any symptoms either. So a person who's coming in with a heart attack, that plaque usually ruptures and they have a blood clot. And so that's a different story. When, when they come in, the artery is totally blocked 100%. So what we do is actually we put a wire through and first of all, we try to suck out that clot. We have special catheters that we take to the artery and we aspirate it out. And then we put a balloon through and, and put a stent through. However, if somebody has stable angina, meaning that actually they don't have a blood clot but have a plaque, which is causing 80% of the blockage, then nothing is going down or we are not aspirating anything. We are just compressing the plaque with the balloon and then putting in the stent. So the artery, the plaque actually stays there. It's, it's different than actually what one can imagine with the plumbing system that one can go in and just brush it out. The, the arterial wall, as we were talking about, is like onion rings. These are three different layers, the intima, media, and adventitia. And the plaque is going to be in between the arterial wall. So you can't go in and actually scrap it out. You just have to actually compress it and take it away from, from the loop. So that's what actually uh, is done. Any other questions? Once you have a stent, uh, what is the, what is, does it mean that you are limited in your uh, ability to do certain things? Or, or is there a lifespan that you can live on? How long? You know, like yeah, thank you very much. It's a good question as well. That actually, is there any limitation if you have a stent put in? Actually, the stent in of itself will restore the blood, the, the blood flow. So, so the plaque buildup is not an overnight thing. This person probably is cooking this plaque for five, seven, ten years, and actually after seven to ten years, it reached to that 70 to 80 percent blockage that it needed that stent. So once we put in the stent, they feel extremely well because previously, a year from now or a, a year from this, a year prior, they were not able to get the same oxygen to the heart muscle. So if they didn't have a heart attack and they just had a blockage and we opened up the blockage, they actually feel really good. Their exercise capacity will, will be much higher, will, will be much better. And however, if they had a heart attack, then the stent in of itself is not limiting their activity or their exertion capacity. However, the amount of damage that has happened to the heart muscle that will define that actually what will be your limitation. That ejection fraction that I was referring to, that's the pumping ability of the heart muscle, that will be dependent on the heart muscle. So that's why it's very important that we realize what are the signs and symptoms of, of heart attack, and we call 911 right away and actually get to the hospital so that we can open up that blocked artery and restore the flow and salvage as much of myocardium, as much of heart muscle as we can to prevent heart failure as well as these limitations. The other thing is actually very important is that what's the, what's the risk of what we call as restenosis, meaning that actually the failure of the stent or the plaque rebuilding. So there are different types of stents available in the market. The ones that actually are used previously, prior to 1994, there were no stents. There were only balloon plastic. 
And if you do balloon angioplasty, the restenosis, meaning the, the narrowing of the artery, was 50% in six months. It was like dental cleaning. You have an angioplasty and every six months you have to go back in and have another angioplasty now. So then came along stents. And actually when you put in bare metal stents, the restenosis rate of a bare metal stent is about 15 to 20 percent. So 85 percent of the time they stay open. Um, drug eluding stents, which are actually the same stents which are uh, stainless steel or cobalt chromium, but there's a drug coating on top of them, they actually decrease the restenosis rate to less than 5%. So more than 95% of the time they stay open. However, they have, the person have, has to be on medications, the blood thinners, for more than a year. That's the downside. And those medications are expensive. People who don't have insurance and they are not able to afford it, or if they are not very compliant with their medications, then we see more problems. So if they stop taking their medications after six months or three months, they will actually come in with what we call a stent thrombosis or blood clot in the stent and they will come in with a heart attack which will be with vengeance. We'll take one more question maybe from the sister's side. Please. They are not exempt from heart diseases as well. <laughs> but, um, anyone else? If not for the sake of time we'll move on to the next one. Sure thing. Alright, so the next thing was actually sudden cardiac death. So sudden cardiac arrest, this is one of the leading causes of death and um, majority of the victims do not have any symptoms, they just collapse, become unconscious and stop breathing. And then actually you have to act quickly to help them, otherwise it's very difficult to revive them and actually bring them back. So it's very important to have an AED which is actually a very um, important thing in the, in the management of people with, uh, um, with sudden cardiac death. Um, God bless the, the scene. And actually he got the Islamic Center an AED. Um, let's hope that we have never have to use this one. However, we need to be ready for if something like that happens uh, in, in the Islamic Center. Sudden cardiac arrest can happen anywhere. It can happen at work, it can happen at home, and it can happen at the masjid as well. And um, AED actually stands for Automated External Defibrillator and it's very simple to use and it's actually a life-saving device. So what is sudden cardiac arrest? To understand this actually, let's, let's look at the electrical system of the heart. The heart actually has got four chambers. So two on the left side, that's actually the left side of the heart. That's as if the patient is looking at you. So that's the left side of the heart. The, top chamber, bottom chamber, and the right side of the heart, the right top chamber and the right bottom chamber. The right top chamber has an electrical generator that's called an SA node, or sinoatrial node, that generates an electrical current that goes through the top chambers, and then it comes to a relay center called an AV node, and then there are specialized wiring called Purkinje fibers that takes the electrical current to the bottom chambers, and that's how actually the heart contracts and relaxes. And when you go to the doctor's office and they do an ECG, ECG stands for electrocardiogram, which is actually the graphic representation of the electrical activity of the heart. So when the electrical impulse goes through and spreads through the top chamber, there is a blip on the ECG that we call as P wave. And then it, when it spreads to the bottom chamber, there is another complex we call as a QRS complex. That implies that the electrical activity in the bottom chamber, and then there is a reset. So top, bottom, reset. Top, bottom, reset. So that's how actually the rhythm of the heart is. It's actually in a very regular manner that the heart is beating. And that is called as sinus rhythm. What happens in, in certain cardiac arrest is that the electrical system of the heart, it starts misfiring in a chaotic, useless fashion that is called as ventricular fibrillation. The heart just actually quivers, it does not, does not contract, it doesn't pump blood. So when it doesn't pump blood, the blood is not going to go to the brain and the person actually suddenly collapses and becomes unconscious. 
And if we don't act quickly, the brain and, and heart, that actually then they will start losing function and ultimately the person will die. So the AED, which is actually the automated external defibrillator, that's the only way to stop ventricular fibrillation. With, ventricle, with AED, what we do is actually we give a controlled electrical shock to the heart which jumps start or restarts the heart back into that normal rhythm, a top bottom chamber reset, rather than actually that chaotic ventricular fibrillation. So to counteract that, we the shock that is applied is, applied is called as defibrillation, and the device that is used for this is called as AED. And AED is actually more effective, or the most effectiveness of an AED is in the first four minutes of a collapse. So if a person collapses, we need to act quickly and without any panic because the, the heart is not pumping blood, so the brain starts having damage which is actually irreparable after three minutes. The heart will start having damage after three to four minutes as well. And when we call 911, the emergency services, they actually come in quickly. However, on an average, an ambulance will take about 6 to 12 minutes to come in. So if you have an AED and you start CPR right away, you will actually save critical time and you can actually save this person's life as well as their brain activity as well as the heart activity. So it's actually very important to use the AED promptly and to be able to know how to use it. It's actually very, very simple to use. So I'm going to list here the steps that we need to know how to actually use AED and then we are actually going to demonstrate it as well. So if you come in and you see somebody collapse or somebody collapses in front of you, what you do is actually you go in and you shake them and you try to wake them up. So you go and tap them on the shoulder or shout at them, are you okay, are you okay? If they are unresponsive, what you do is actually you go and call 911 if you are by yourself. If there's somebody else, you assign that person and tell him, go and call 911 and bring the AED and you start CPR yourself. CPR is actually stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Once again, cardio will be heart, pulmonary is lungs, and resuscitation is reviving. So um, if you call 911 and get the AED, then what you do is actually you check for breathing, you lift their chin and actually make sure that they are breathing okay. And then what you do is you attach the AED, turn on the AED and put the pads on them and the AED then guides you, it actually talks to you and it tells you what to do. So you just follow the commands of the AED and by the time that you have given them CPR for two or three minutes, the EMS will come and they will, they will take over. So the AED that we have here is our Philips AED. There are different brands and different varieties of AEDs. Um, not only in the Islamic Center, you can be in an airport, you can be at a gym, it can be other places, however, uh, if you see somebody collapse, try to look for these signs which says AED and try to actually grab one. So let's go over the steps that we, that we talked about, but if you see somebody who has collapsed. What I have is actually a Medtronic uh, AED here. They are very similar to use. This is a training device, so that's why I'm going to use this one. And then we'll go over ours as well. So, you, you're walking in, you see somebody who actually in front of you collapsed, or you came in and actually somebody's already collapsed. So you go in and you say, hello sir, are you okay, are you okay? And 
if they do not respond to you, what you're going to do is actually go and call 911. And when you call 911, you will tell the operator that you have somebody who has collapsed and he's not breathing and is unresponsive and you have an AED available. So they can also guide you at that point in time as well what to do if you have a cell phone. They will say, okay, stay with me and I will walk you through how to do CPR. So you got the AED. You will bring the AED and actually you will put it the same side where you are. And you will turn it on. So when you, connect, you, you turn it on, it tells you to connect the electrodes. These are the electrodes that come in with an AED. I'll actually show you the ones that we have as well. And the electrodes actually have pictures. There are two electrodes. One electrode goes over the right shoulder as the picture shows. So you're going to actually, there's a sticker on, at the back of it. You're going to peel off the sticker and you're going to put it on the right side of the shoulder as the picture shows you, okay? And then the other also has a picture that shows you that actually it's going to go under the left arm. So you're going to place it exactly the way that it is. And so you place it where the picture shows you. So you remove the clothing? You remove the clothing, actually. So, so what you did was actually you came in, the person was actually unresponsive. Our person did not have any clothing. What you need to do is actually need to remove the clothing. Don't be nice to the clothing. Just rip it off. Time is what matters here. Our AED actually also comes with, with a scissor as well. This is actually to cut the clothing. So if somebody is wearing a necktie or if there's a, a hard piece of clothing that you cannot uh, take it off, you just rip it off. Don't be nice to the clothing. Be, do it as quickly as possible. So connect the electrodes. When, when this happens, then so, so the, the, what, the, what the AED is telling you is actually to stand clear. Do not touch the patient at this time. actually will, you will press and you will deliver the shock. So what happens is that actually you came in, somebody's down, you got, you called 911, got the AED, you came in, you bear open the chest, you applied the electrodes, but before you apply the electrodes you turn on the device. So our device, our AED, has an on-off button right here. So either you press that button or you pull this lever right here. That will actually turn on the device. And then it will start talking to you. What it tells you is that actually to apply the electrodes, which actually you're going to apply the way that the picture shows you. One is going to go on the right shoulder, the other one is going to go on the left side. And then it tells you to actually do not touch the patient. The AED analyzes the heart rhythm. And it sees whether this person is in ventricular fibrillation or not. So there are actually different causes of sudden cardiac arrest. Sometimes the person's heart is just completely stopped, which we call as asystole. And that asystole does not require shock. So then, it would, then you would need to do CPR. So if the AED analyzes that shock is not needed, it will tell you that as well. The shock is not advised, continue CPR. So when it, develop, it delivers a shock, and actually after the shock, it will tell you to start CPR. So what you do with CPR is that actually you, this patient has a bare chest. At the nipple line, you're actually going to put the heel of one hand on their chest and the other heel on the other side and you're going to press about two inches down. 
and you're going to start compressions at a rate of about 100 compressions a minute. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So you start doing this, those compressions. Previously, it used to be that we used to teach people to do 30 compressions and then do two mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing is not important. It's actually the compressions which is important. So if you keep on doing the compressions, and what you need to do is actually make sure that the person is breathing. So what you do, you, you uh, open up their airway by doing the, the chin lift. So you lift up their chin so that their airway is open. And if they, are, if they need to breathe, they are going to be able to breathe easily. So once two minutes are completed, the AED will once again tell you to not, not touch the patient. It will analyze the heart rhythm. If a shock is advised, it will deliver the shock by itself, and then it will tell you to resume CPR. And if the person actually wakes up and starts moving around, do not take away the, the, the pads. Because actually the person can have another ventricular fibrillation event. And then the, the AED continuously monitors the heart rhythm, and if that type of thing happens, this can actually deliver the shock right away and actually saves the time and actually start perfusing the brain as well as the heart and other vital organs. And so when the emergency medical team arrives, they can actually assess the heart rhythm from, from your device as well. So let's actually look at our device here. So you brought it in, it was actually in, in a space you set it on the side where you were, you opened it up. When you take it out, one of two things you could do. You could either press this button, which is the on-off button. Begin by removing all clothing from the patient's chest. Cut clothing if needed. So it tells you exactly what you need to do. Very, very simple to, to use. And if you have to cut, you have the scissor right away. The patient's chest is bare. <coughs> Remove protective cover and take out white adhesive pads. So this is what it's saying. You when take this out. When the chest is bare, remove protective cover take and this. take out white and adhesive actually, pads. Actually, this is the, the pads. We can actually rip this out. And the same type of pads that we have will come out when from inside. When the chest is bare, Remove protective cover and take out white adhesive pads. So this is what it's referring to. From if I do this, actually, this, these pads are going to be destroyed. So I'm not going to actually open when that. Up. However, these there, are the steps. Remove you take protective it. cover. The other thing is, and take out white so adhesive you have to pads. turn it off. You just power it down, and it just turns off. The other way is actually, if you don't want to even. So the other way to actually turn it on, somebody is collapsed, you bring it, you open it up. You don't even have to press this button. You open this up and it starts by itself. Again, by removing all clothing from the patient's chest. Cut right. clothing if needed. Cut clothing if needed. And then it waits for you. It gives you the time to be able to do that. And then it talks to you back. When So this is the protective cover that it wants you to take out and what is inside this is actually these pads. And these adhesive pads are going to actually attach. Once you attach it, it tells you do not touch the patient. It's going to analyze the heart rhythm. If shock is advised, it will tell you shock is advised, do not touch the patient. And then when it charges up, it will tell you to press this button. So that button is what delivers the shock. So once it's loaded and it tells you press the yellow button or orange button to deliver the shock, that will start blinking. Once that starts blinking, you press that without touching the patient. If you touch the patient, 
you're going to get a shock as well. So do not touch the patient when actually it's delivering a shock. So you deliver that shock, and then it analyzes the heart rhythm again. If another shock is needed, it will do the same thing. If another shock is not needed, it will tell you to start CPR, which is actually the chest compressions. You put the heel of the hand at the level of the nipples on the middle of the chest, another hand on the side, your hands are straight, and you put pressure and you're going to compress the chest wall for at least two inches. So that is going to be the compression. That is enough to actually give enough blood flow to the rest of the organs as well as to the brain to keep the brain perfusing while the heart is actually in fibrillation. So um, that's actually about the AED. It's extremely simple. It's actually a life-saving device. Um, if you see somebody who's collapsed anywhere in an airport, in a gym, um, anywhere that you are at work, get the AED, call 911, and actually uh, start CPR and use the AED, and actually you will save a life. I think um, if somebody wants to come in and do the chest compression, they could do that. If you guys have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Is the machine only one time used? I'm oh, sorry? Is one time used? The pads are used one time. No, the machine actually has a battery. That actually can last four years. And so once these pads are used, you put new pads in. These pads cost about $70 a piece. Um, they're disposable. Um, but you put more pads in and actually the same machine will be used. So this machine is to be used forever and ever. To keep on changing the battery. I have a question. Can you mention that uh, CPR for about two inches? How much pressure should be applied to the patient? Because everybody has a different body, right? Yeah. So we don't want to break a cake or something like that. Yeah. So a uh, good question. However, try not to think of not breaking, not breaking the ribs. A CPR in an older person, it's okay to break ribs because you are saving his life. So don't think that actually you're applying too much of pressure. And um, usually, roughly people say 30 pounds of weight, but how are you going to judge 30 pounds? And the other thing is actually when the adrenaline is pumping and somebody is down and you're doing compressions, you know these, these pads, it doesn't say right shoulder. There's actually a picture on it. Why? Because when we are panicked, we cannot breathe. We lose the ability to read. So that's why these pictures are there that actually tells us, okay, this is the picture, I'm just going to put it right there. So nobody thinks that I'm going to apply 30 pounds pressure or whatever. You just have to do the compressions. The other thing, I'm sorry, that, which is very important in our device is that actually it also tells you the timing of compressions as well. So when it tells you to start CPR and you want further uh, information or further guidance from this device, if you press this I, it starts a rhythm that actually you will you will tie your rhythm to the beats that actually it will uh, that you can count the compressions. So it's actually about 100 compressions per minute. But if you want to time it, this actually starts doing a rhythm beats for you. So that actually you can keep the compression um, continued. And then actually you compress for two minutes, and then when it's time, the, the device tells you itself that it stop. Do not test the patient. It analyzes the rhythm and then it tells you if you have to resume the CPR. The AED, there are actually different uh, prices. I don't know what that's being paid for this, but usually it's somewhere between $1,500 to $2,000. Yeah, uh, we paid uh, about $1,250 for this, which includes a cabinet with an alarm on it. So we got a good deal. <laughs> For the CPR, what about the surface? Does the patient have to be on a hard surface compared to the bed or? Exactly. So thank you very much. That's actually a very good question. We, when a person in the hospital has what we call as code blue, we have white boards that we put underneath them. But if at home somebody goes down on a mattress, it's better to actually put them on a harder surface. But if somebody is collapsing here in the masjid, obviously they're going to be down on the floor, so you're perfectly fine. Um, to actually use it there. So, but the reason of collapse is not something related to the heart. It is related to the heart because the heart was what went into that chaotic electrical rhythm that ventricular fibrillation, 
And because of that, the heart stopped pumping, and the blood was not going to the oxygen, and the brain stopped functioning, so the person just collapsed. So now what you have to do is to defibrillate, meaning actually you have to put the rhythm back, so once you shock the heart, you stop the heart and jump start it, in the hopes that it will actually jump start in that regular rhythm, and it will start that rhythmic compression of the top chambers first, the bottom chambers later, and the brain will start with perfusion. Is it possible somebody will collapse for any other reason besides the heart? Thank you. Yes, I, this is usually a, a big thing when somebody collapses, and and when the when they get admitted to the hospital, they get a cardiologist consult and a neurologist consult. So either they're having a seizure that they will be collapsed, or they're actually having a cardiac arrest. So these are the two main reasons. However, there can be some metabolic reasons as well, but the person will be extremely sick. Like suppose somebody has. Uh, very advanced uh, renal failure and their electrolytes are completely out of uh, balance. They have a lot of blood urea and so, or they have advanced liver failure, they can also pass out as well. Exactly, so thank you very much. This is, so, so you can still use, so don't be shy to use a defibrillator. The defibrillator is not going to shock anybody if shock is not needed. So a very um, intelligent device. When you apply the pads, this, this defibrillator starts looking at the ECG. So there's an ECG that actually can be printed out from this as well. So when the EMS arrives, and they can actually hook up to our device and see exactly what kind of rhythm the patient was in. Because it's very important down the road for management of that patient and what was the cause of that collapse. So if there is another reason for collapse of that patient and a shock is not needed, this device will tell you that shock is not needed, but it will still tell you to do CPR. And you're going to continue CPR until the patient is responsive. However, when they become responsive, do not take off the, the pads. Keep the pads on. Since when the mouth to mouth portion of the CPR has been Actually, it's, it's not removed, but it's not very important. Previously, we used to, until 2010, the ACLS guidelines used to say ABC, which was airway, um, breathing, and circulation. Now it's circulation. Now it's compression, compression, and compression. It's equally good. It's equally good, because actually the breathing, people actually are too much into that, that actually, uh, how am I going to do the mouth to mouth breathing? There's also these communicable diseases, so people don't want to do CPR. However, majority of the benefit that you're getting from the CPR is actually perfusing the, the organs. There's still oxygen in that blood. Although if the patient is not breathing, there's still oxygen that if you keep on perfusing the brain, it will still get the oxygen. So if you do the compressions, and actually if you start the heart as soon as possible, and the heart starts pumping, they will start breathing as well. If you could do both. If you could do both, you would. But like in ACLS, like in the hospital, we have an ambu bag. So when the crash cart comes in and code blue is there, we actually put the ambu bag, and actually we have the compression that, that, that we do, and we do the same thing. 30 compressions, 2 breaths. 30 compressions, 2 breaths. That's what we do. However, in CPR, if you could do, if this is your son, your dad, um, that's what you should be doing as well. Do 30 compressions, two breaths. How long does the process go though? I mean, like, I'm sorry? How long does this process go? Is it like four minutes, five minutes, if the ambulance doesn't come out, come out for like 20 minutes? How, how should it go? Ahead? Exactly. Yes, yeah, so uh, in the field, fortunately, the, the response time of EMS is, is, as I showed, it's 6 to 12 minutes. And fortunately, here in Lansing, we have uh, the fire department, the EMS people will be here in 6 to 12 minutes. However, in the hospital, when we have this, we have patients, we have all kinds of drugs, we have all kinds of machines that we could do. Sometimes our codes can go up to 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 1 hour. And then there's a point that we reach that we call it futile. That after that, even if the person's circulation comes back, 
the brain damage has so much uh, that actually they will not have a good quality of life. So then we go and talk to the family that we have been working on the patient for one hour or 45 minutes. Two physicians decide that it's going to be futile and we call the code, so we stop it. However, in the field, when you're doing it, it's usually two to 10 minutes or 20 minutes, will be actually an extremely long time. However, um, it will keep on going. So the, the chest compressions also, it's very tiring. So you're doing it for two minutes. After two minutes, you're going to be exhausted. So what we do is actually in the hospital when we're doing it, we keep on rotating. So there will be one person who will do the chest compressions, then another person will come on. Then another person will come on, so we keep on rotating. So here as well, if you have two or three different people, then the first two minutes one person should do, the next two minutes the other person should do, and that's how uh, things will work. However, hopefully within four or five minutes the EMS will be here. Please. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, now we talked about the, uh, the breathing, uh, and one of the things that we talked about, even though now we, uh, in the prison seven, we, it's almost a mandate every year we have to do CPR. Uh, we talked about the positive air in the room. Uh, that I'm sorry, you, know, you talk about? Uh, the positive air uh -huh. in the room. So as I do chest compression, I'm actually pulling that air into the chest cavity, which is about 20, 21% which is better than what I'll give that person mm -hmm. a two miles to my resuscitation. Uh, so again, so we encourage, again, uh, in, because of the contamination of the diseases out there, that actually a good compression uh, that somebody is doing, which is we talk about, you know, at least two, mm -hmm. uh, two inches depth, uh, that really people need to understand that concept as well. So you really draw an air, which is such kind of things better than what you would give the person. Uh, the other thing that you mentioned, uh, again, yes, indeed, CPR is very tiring. Understanding what muscles groups use, again, for the chest compression. So I'm not using my tricep and my bicep, but rather the trapezoid muscles or the muscle in the shoulders that are stronger and they can sustain or endure doing CPR a little longer than if you don't have those, or the elbows are not really straight or maybe bent. Uh, so again, those are other kinds of, I mean, those are techniques that we learn to make sure that because indeed we've got to do that for 10 or 20 minutes before somebody takes over in some situation because I live remotely far away from the hospital in the city. Um, now the pads, uh, one time use, you use it once, it's gone, I'm not sure how many sets we have. Uh, and again, the other thing that I want to talk about the comfortability because a person who is younger, uh, let's say maybe a person who is 9 or 10 years old, uh, what the age group for applying or rather using the AED? Thank you very much. All of these are extremely important questions and actually that will uh, further the, uh, uh, the goal that we have here. So the first thing was that actually when we are doing chest compressions, well Simon is extremely right, that actually when we do the chest compressions, when I compress and when the chest wall is coming up, so there's actually negative pressure. The only way that it's going to come up is by sucking air from the outside. So this person is going, there will be a 25 to 30 cc's of air that is going to go automatically into his mouth and his airways. That's what he's referring to. So, uh, however, if, if you can give um, mouth to mouth breathing to, as I said, to your kid or somebody else, the tidal volume that we have is about 500 cc's, so that's actually a lot of, of air that you can actually give someone. And when you're doing that, you want to see that the chest is rising. So if you're just doing chest compressions, don't think that you're not providing them respiration. They are getting air with that two inches of compression, because when the chest wall is springing back, you're sucking air from, from the outside. The other thing was actually to the technique of, of the uh, chest compressions for us uh, said rightly that actually we are using actually the shoulder muscles and you're locking your, your elbows so this is actually very straight and this person is going to be on the floor so you're actually really on top of the person and so it becomes easier for you to compress and what you're going to look for if you compress the chest to higher up then the sternum is not going to go down, it's actually going to be very stiff. It shouldn't be the end of the breast bone, it shouldn't be the very epigastrium that we call it, it should be the nipple line where actually you're going to put your, the heel of the hand. And that's where actually you're going to get the most compression. 
And then what you're doing is actually your whole body is going down and up, and you're actually going to time it at 100 compressions per minute. Once again, you can use the eye button there that will tell you the rhythm that can actually guide you. The other thing that Brother Saini mentioned uh, very important was actually the age limit. So these pads can be used for, for 8 years of age and above. Kids who are younger than 8 years of age, they need to have what we call as pediatric pads, and fortunately we have pediatric pads. So if we have a kid who is less than 50 pounds of weight, or is 8 years or less than that, then you use the pediatric pads. What you do is open it up, and instead of these pads, you actually attach the electrodes to the machine, and you do it similarly. And actually it tells you where to put these pads. In a kid who is eight years or younger than eight or younger than eight years of age, you put one in the front and one in the back, instead of one on the right side and one on the left side. And once again, the pictures tell the whole story. It tells you where to apply it. I'm sorry? Uh, throwing up the person that yeah. you, regardless of right? Exactly. So, um, so when somebody is actually uh, uh, collapses, when they are coming back to their senses, it's not uncommon that they will actually be nauseated and they can actually start vomiting. If that happens, you want their head to be in a certain position so that they do not aspirate their vomitus. So you actually put them in the left lateral position as long as they're moving, they're up in their senses, and you don't need to do compressions anymore. So then you actually put them in the left lateral position. But once again, by that time, hopefully the EMS is there, and um, hopefully they will take over. Okay, I think we kept you uh, pretty long, which is actually our pair. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, one, it costs us about $12.50 to buy it. We didn't wait to collect donations, but donations are always welcome. So you can leave it at the table, inshallah. It will go towards saving a life. So you can imagine the reward you will get. Uh, secondly, uh, next uh, next Friday, inshallah, we're going to have dental health awareness, inshallah. We have a dentist in the community who is going to present there. Uh, we close again scheduled to be done about a month ago, but he wanted to get some goodies from Chris, and he's going to, he managed to get that in this past month. So we're going to have the next Friday, inshallah. Uh, also, if anyone wants to buy this uh, with the distributors from, I actually contacted Philips and they put me in touch with the distributor in Grand Rapids. Uh, they said they will offer it at the same price at what we bought. So I'll forward you our invoice and you can contact them and get it at the same price. Um, also, in February, uh, they're going to, I have been in touch with the American Heart Health Association and they want to do a Women Heart Health Awareness Campaign. And they want to do this in February where they want us to color the building red, not painted red, but I guess mm -hmm. decorated red so that uh, you build some awareness and stuff. Fortunately, I won't be the president, but the person will have to wear the brunt because it's Valentine's month. <laughs> so he will get the brunt of it. But it's, uh, the idea behind it is to build awareness that women are not exempt from heart health, uh, heart diseases. Uh, once again, Jazakla uh, Khair, Dr. Ibrahim Shah. One final question. We have some youngsters in the crowd, sure. uh, audience. So what does it take for them uh, this is such a noble profession, so what would it take for them to become a Dr. Ibrahim Shah one day? <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for, for your time. Um, it is a very noble profession, it's a very rewarding profession as well, and actually the satisfaction that you get from this, it's priceless. Um, especially being a cardiologist, you see a person who is actually at the deathbed, they're having a heart attack, the family is just distraught. You take them to the cab lab, you open up the artery, you save the patient, it takes about 45 minutes and an hour, the whole thing just changes. And you see the looks, the satisfaction on the patient's family's faces, the patient's face, that is actually just, uh, just priceless. Um, to become a physician, obviously, it takes a lot of hard work and dedication. And um, uh, I hope that actually uh, all of our youths, they are, they are actually very good and 
their parents uh, will guide them in the right way to, to be more dedicated and, and hardworking. And I don't see why they can become physicians and cardiologists and surgeons. So it's like a fellowship, right? those things. So uh, to become a cardiologist, you actually uh, first go through medical school. And then actually after medical school, you do your residency, which is actually three years of residency. And once you complete your three years of residency, you become an internist. So you are an internal medicine doctor. You have the choice of going and starting practice as, as internal medicine, or you can go into further fellowships. Because again, it's actually very competitive to go into different fellowships. Um, medicine has its own branches, and surgery has its own branches. So, um, to become a cardiologist, you have to do three more years of training on top of the three years of residency. And then to become an interventional cardiologist, you have to do another one year of training in that intervention. So it takes about seven years after finishing medical school of training to become an interventional cardiologist. And when cardiologists fail, we don't take more. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, we don't want to mention that. That's a very small comment. <laughs> uh, Brother Sani just reminded that there's a blood drive that's going to happen on Friday, December 27th, inshallah. Uh, you can go to the Red Cross website and sign up. Uh, we'll be putting it up shortly on our website. There will be a code, Lansing Islam, which you use to make an appointment so that you're not waiting in the line, inshallah. So try to encourage as many brothers and sisters to take part in the blood donation. And once again, uh, Jazak Lafayette, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Shah, may Allah reward you and your family for all these great patients. Um, thank you again. For well, thank you very much. And actually, there is all this information that Brother Basim has arranged from the American Heart Association. This is about heart health. And uh, you guys are welcome to take this information.